I think it's because when we're kids, we think of camouflage, animal camouflage, pretty simplistically. Like it is just a beetle looking like bird poop, for example, or a spider looking like it could be part of a flower, like crab spiders do. Don't look like crabs. And, and just like anything in nature, though, it gets more complicated, camouflage does, the more you look into it, because nature is almost infinitely interesting. For example, there's a snake named the flame snake that uses a very, very weird kind of camouflage. Scientists call it flicker fusion camouflage, and this is how it works. See those bands on its body? They're yellow, red, and black. Now, what the snake does as it moves, it goes through rapid bursts of speed, which you're seeing here. And because of the flicker fusion frequency that our brain has, how many basically frames per second that we see, because the different bands of colors are passing our eyes more quickly or more slowly, it can make it look like the snake is traveling in a different direction than it is. It's almost exactly the same thing that happens when you're looking at a car tire on the highway and the wheels suddenly look like they're traveling in the opposite direction. It's because the frame rate of those wheels is not matching up with our eyes so it can start to look like it goes in the opposite direction. And this snake through evolution alone has harnessed that ability to mess with predators' visual systems by changing the speed at which it travels through the ground using its own form of camouflage. It's like perceptual camouflage and that is so cool. It's not even trying to look like bird poop. And welcome to another edition of Footnotes, the companion show to Because Science, where I take your comments, questions, and corrections, and complaints about sponsorships, enjoy all the free content, and I answer them here in the hopes of all, all of us getting just a little bit smarter, or you can waste about 25 minutes at work, or wherever you listen. On the toilet? Some of you do, statistically. Oh, and I also tell you what's coming up next on this channel. Oh, the anticipation. Uh, uh. So on the last episode of Because Science, we were trying to figure out what a real spidey sense would be. What would give Peter Parker the power, the perceptual power to do everything that we see him do in the comics and movies and video games, the new video games, really good by the way, pick it up. What could be the explanation for that? Well, I said that you don't have to look any further than spiders and arachnids themselves. They have some of the most biologically sensitive senses of any creature on this planet. And if Peter Parker incorporated real spider senses or something like them into his own, then they would indeed, I think, think give him something that is spectacular or amazing or another adjective that is used to describe him. But what did you have to say? Our first comment comes from Jay Morris who says spider sense wouldn't be a sixth sense. It would technically be a 22nd sense because humans have 21 senses. Well, I don't, I don't know where you're getting that number from, but you're right. Humans definitely have more than five main senses, so it doesn't really make sense to say sixth sense all the time like something that we don't actually have. The sixth sense thing needs to die because we can sense gravity. We can, we can sense changes in our own acceleration. We can sense where our own limbs are in space. And it's not really touch, it's proprioception. So we have many more than five senses, but you could call it a sixth sense if you were ordering it that way, I guess. It's right uh, before the sense where you see uh, dead people, but after the sense where you can smell asparagus in your pee. No, that's just smell. Our next comment comes from Zemithian, who says, if this extreme sensitivity of spider senses is true, which science proves, then how is it possible that something so perfect could have been acquired via evolution, and at the same time, so many zillion more perfections uh, at the same time? And at the same time, you like saying that, why haven't we seen apes or anything else evolving in zoos or in the wild? I think there's a few misconceptions here that maybe some of you have, which are good to go through. Now, let's remember how evolution works. It doesn't start, first of all, with anything perfect. Evolution works with what it has through random mutations that occur in animal populations and then goes from there and selects what works. Not what is best, not what is the most perfect version, but simply what works, what helps an animal or organism uh, further their genes. Evolution works base level like that. 
via natural selection. So spider senses, even though they are incredible, did not start out presumably so incredible. Evolution would throw up some random mutation that would make a spider more sensitive or a proto spider more sensitive to this or that. And because it would give just a slight evolutionary advantage for the spider's genes, that would be selected by nature in that they didn't get eaten as much or whatever, or they procreated more. And then those genes would find themselves more uh, common throughout a spider population. And so over time, over millions of years, you would get something that is more and more and more refined. As more evolutions happen, more selection happens, and you go through more populations of creature. Spider senses are only as good as they are because they went through literally millions of years of trial and error, only selecting what works and, and eliminating from the gene pool what doesn't. That's how you get things that are so amazing and so seemingly perfect and designed like human eyes or something like that, but that only can happen because it happens over such a long period of time of trial and error. If you had a million or a billion years to get something right, just through trial and error alone, eventually you'd come up with something pretty good and that's what nature has done. Secondly, let's remember the time scale over which evolution happens. It does not happen overnight, and it doesn't really happen, depending on the creature, in the scale of a single human lifetime. So if you went to the zoo every day and you looked at the apes there, you wouldn't see them evolving, changing over time, because the lifespan of an ape or a monkey can get pretty close to that of a human. And evolution happens at the scale of generations and over thousands and millions of years. So you would have to observe these populations for the same time to see any change. And that's what we do with fossils and, uh, and genetic information that we have from creatures so we can see how genomes have changed over time. But there are creatures that you can see evolve in real time in our lifetimes. There are bacteria that reproduce every few minutes or every few hours. And because they do that, they have so many generations in a human lifetime that we can see evolution happening in real time. And there are experiments that do just that that can see evolution happen before our very eyes and to test what would happen if the population of bacteria experienced uh, you know, this temperature or had this food. So, Semithean, evolution may not be happening before your very eyes for some creatures, but it can and does happen before our very eyes for some creatures, and it is a constant process. Even though we're not seeing something like a proto-giraffe grow a longer neck in our lifetime, evolution is constantly happening, constantly refining concepts in biology that work through natural selection and eventually, over time, making something Spectacular. That's why nature is so cool. Evolution is the unifying thread through all of biology. Biology doesn't really make sense on Earth without it. Our next comment comes from Aaron Bagel, who says, don't we kind of already have a less extreme version of spider sense ourselves? Considering something like a baseball player, when a ball is pitched, it's traveling pretty dang fast. Hardly fast enough for the human brain to perceive its motion all the way to the bat and swing the bat accordingly to hit it with its tiny surface area. And yet we've managed to make it a professional sport because people can still smack those balls out of the park. I agree that doing something like hitting a baseball moving a hundred miles an hour is pretty incredible and it's incredible that we can do it but I do not think it is the same kind of sense that spiders have. This is more of a predictive thing that our brains are doing. Because baseballs travel so fast there is a point at which the ball will be so close to the batter that they will not have time to react and swing the bat. So what the brain is doing is predicting using innate physics and in our understanding of it. Predicting where the ball is going to be by the time you swing the bat. You're actually swinging the bat before the ball gets to the bat. You have to, and so your brain predicts the motion of the ball. It's not quite the same thing as sensing where the ball is right in front of you and then reacting to it and then making a motion. I think it is more of a predictive thing, which spider sense could feasibly include, but because it's a fictional thing that Peter Parker has, I think we have to separate the two. But by far the nerdiest comment at the time I'm filming this episode, I'm giving to Martesian Van Wheel, who says, Spider-Man, sp I can't sing the song legally, so bear with me. Spider-Man, Spider-Man, does whatever a spider can. Feels a touch, any strength, when his tactile hot hair stand on end. <laughs> Look out, here comes Spider-Man. Is he keen? You betcha. He's got trichobothria. They sense pressure and even light. That's how Spidey wins the fight. Hey there. There goes Spider-Man. 
The slits and scylla on his joints, like sensitive tremor sensing points. Spider-Man, Spider-Man, friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. Cartoon physics, he ignores. Science is his reward. Look out, here comes the Spider-Man. Kyle Hill stands out with great defiance when he needs, whenever he needs to science. Someone like Spider-Man. I'm not sure all of that worked, but I don't care. It's awesome. And for that, you are indeed a super nerd. Ah! Nothing came out. But of course, I'm not always right. Why would I want to be? Then what would I learn? So what did I get wrong last week? Our first correction is the big one, and it comes from a lot of people who all say, okay, Kyle, well, if Peter Parker had spider-like senses for his spider sense, wouldn't he be constantly overwhelmed by the, the, the wind in New York and the sound of taxis and everything and the feel of his suit on his skin? Wouldn't it completely overload his senses and be a pain or painful? Okay, well, I really should have addressed this in the episode. I was going to, but I didn't have time. Spiders do have amazing senses, but what I was saying is their raw sensing power, what they could possibly feel, the limit of what they could feel. At the very limit of what they could feel, it's close to what's physically possible in this universe, which is awesome. But that isn't what they feel. So because spiders are so potentially sensitive, their senses are kind of gated. They only sense what they need to sense, that's what's biologically important to them. They will not register and feel every possible motion of molecules in the air. They will feel, for example, instead, just the frequency of the wing beats of a fly, not any old breeze, and not just thermal Brownian motion constantly bombarding them. They are, they are, they have evolved to respond to more specific stimuli than that. So if Peter Parker had a similar mutation that gave him spider-like senses, it's plausible that he would also have the same kind of gating to his senses, that his sensory systems would accept some stimuli, but reject or attenuate, make smaller other ones. So he wouldn't be constantly overwhelmed. It's kind of like the idea behind Spider-Man's eye slits, how they open and close to let in more or less light. If he's being bombarded by too much stimulus, you can attenuate that stimulus. Similarly, maybe his senses have mutated so that he is only reacting to things that are biologically important for him to react to. So it's not just the sound of every taxi or the gust of every New York slice. Oh, but it's more specific than that. What? That that's how they, that's, yeah, yeah. have you ever been to New York? No. But I was I've been in New York twice. And what I can tell you being, you know, basically a New Yorker is that when you're walking around, it is, oh, oh, what do you think you are? Oh, Petey Parks? No, come on, Spider-Man. More like Cider Man, hand me some drink. Oh! And if you think about it, as The Void pointed out to me just now, your brain does this already. So right now, you can see your nose. You're welcome. Your brain just edits it out of your vision because you're, it's constantly in your vision, so it's just easier to kind of perceptually wipe that out. Your brain is attenuating a stimulus. So if Peter Parker's brain adapted to do the same kind of thing with his newfound senses, it's plausible that he wouldn't be constantly and completely overwhelmed like, like Superman just learning that he can hear people a mile away or whatever. He learned too. See? Our next correction comes from Timur Shaw, who says, actually, Kyle, Spider-Man first came out in Amazing Fantasy number 15, a picture of which you can see here, which was published in August 1962, not 1963, as you said. Yes, he, you're, you're right. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, man, I even clicked on this Wikipedia page. What am I, an idiot? Ah, okay, so, yes. So, I was mistaken. I used the first Spider-Man comic in 1963 as my starting point for Spider-Man instead of Spider-Man's first appearance, as you said, which was in 1962. And that comic from 1962, one of them, uh, sold for $450,000. I have nothing to add. That is just, that's more money than Peter Parker ever made. Our next correction comes from Mahadev Pandey, who says, 
Millinewtons should be MN. Micronewtons would be denoted by the Greek letter mu. I said in the episode at one point that a spider, uh, its legs can feel a force equivalent to 0 0.01 millinewtons. I wrote millinewtons, but I said micronewtons, which would be a thousand times smaller. So I was incorrect. I wrote millinewtons and I meant to say millinewtons, but I said micro instead because it's hard making these episodes. So sometimes I'm, I mess up. So you are right. I'm wrong. But think just, just the amount of force that is. It is so amazingly small. It's, 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 the spider senses are spectacular. I love this kind of thing. I had no idea. I dismissed it. Then I looked into it. I was totally wrong and I learned something. That's what I love about making these episodes. Also, I love being corrected by you. But the nerdiest correction at the time I'm filming this episode, I'm giving to Christopher Lashley, who uh, points out that some others pointed out, but just in a better way. Great video, Kyle. Wouldn't Spidey's web fluid be cold since it's adiabatically expanding once released from the pressurized web cartridge? I always imagined it'd be similar to silly string. So when I got webbed at the end of the episode, I said it feels like hot spaghetti. But would Spider-Man's webs be hot? Interesting. Interesting. Canonically, Spider-Man's web fluid is pressurized, highly pressurized fluid inside little canisters that he puts on his wrist and then and they come out. Now, an easy way for that to work would be like an aerosol can with liquid propellant inside of it. So you take a gas, that is a gas at room temperature, and you put it inside of a can at high pressure. And at high enough pressure, at room temperature, it will be a liquid. Now when you press the button, the liquid inside, no longer under that pressure, expands in our atmosphere and changes phase back into a gas. And when that happens, because it is expanding rapidly, the temperature goes way, way down. Heat energy goes into that fluid as it is evaporating and it, and it takes heat away from what it is touching. That is why sweating works so good. It's because the heat is going into evaporating the liquid that forms on the surface of your body. And that is also why things like air dusters will get really, really cold if you release gas from them too quickly or even if you tip them upside down, which you shouldn't do. That releases the fluid instead of the gas, which takes even more heat away. All that is to say that if Spider-Man's web fluid kind of acts like an aerosol can and the web fluid has some kind of liquid propellant that was once a gas at room temperature, then as it expands out, that gas will propel Spidey's web and it could form kind of a solid as it's supposed to with different polymers and plasticizers in it, but that propellant would expand into a gas and get colder, thereby making the webs themselves colder to the touch and not hot like I said. And for thinking about the thermodynamics of Spider-Man silk that much, Christopher, you are indeed a super nerd. <laughs> now, if you are already subscribed to Alpha at projectalpha.com, you already know what the next episode of Because Science is going to be because you saw it this morning. Lucky you, you got it two days earlier than anyone else and you got to peep some other premium content that I do there and some people at Geek & Sundry and Nerdist do there. It even gets you discounts on new merch, which we have in the store. You wanna be a smart boy or bae, right? Go pick it up. But if you are not subscribed to Alpha just yet, okay, fine. The next episode of Because Science is going to be The Predator Explained. That's right, in this week's episode of Because Science, I'm telling you everything you need to know about the iconic alien hunter known as the Predator. How does its camouflage work? Why does its blood glow? And how could it possibly see in infrared? That's what's coming up next, because if it bleeds, we can science it, oh. So go watch the latest episode of Because Science all about spider sense. If you haven't yet, leave me your comments, questions, and corrections at youtube.com slash because science, facebook.com slash because science, and at because science on social media. There's also a subreddit for Kyle Hill and Because Science. I pop in there sometimes if you want to. And remember, if you have ever said that something is everything, I will need you to go back and clarify to everyone that everything that was everything before this everything is no longer everything. I know it's confusing, but so is your choice in words. Beep.